Hello and welcome. Bon dia. In Portuguese, that means good morning. We have had a uh, wonderful, wonderful experience uh, in Brazil. You heard me speak about last year's experience, but last year was nothing, nothing at all in comparison to where uh, we were and what our ministry was and the effects of that. When I left out last Friday and I had to leave a day early, earlier than the rest of the group, it was very emotional for me. The presence of God was felt in such a real and meaningful and special way. We saw decisions made for Christ. It was just a special time. Thank you for your care. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your concern. It's good to be back home, and I can't wait to go to Cracker Barrel and Waffle House. <laughs> Eat some real American food. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, it's so good to be in your house with your people, worshiping with you in all of your fullness and all of your truth. We thank you, Lord, for how you work in our lives, for the things that you teach us, the things that you show us, how you work through us in our daily lives, your circumstances, your situations through the people that you bring to cross our paths. I thank you personally for a life-changing experience this week. In your son. For the people that we were able to share with, for their hunger for you, for their love, for their affirmation, for their hugs, we just pray, Lord, that you would continue to be at work in them. In the high and holy name of our beautiful Savior and risen Savior, Christ Jesus, we ask these things. Amen. Now you know what a Brazilian nut means. <laughs> Actually, it means milkweed in Brazil. <laughs> Let's stand this morning, and we are going to sing hymn number 581. We have heard the joyful sound, and we'll sing the first, second, and the last.
way of announcements <laughs> real quickly. <laughs> Next Sunday, we are planning on having our annual hayride. Normally we do that the first Sunday in August. October. October. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> she was real good at the nine o'clock service, corrected me three times. <laughs> Who cares if she's right? But anyway, it's not August, it is October. But because I was out of town and out of the country, we chose not to do that uh, last week. And just getting back in yesterday was rushing things a little, so we're planning on doing that next Sunday afternoon. Be prepared, um, we'll leave here around five o'clock, and we'll have all the wagons and the hay and all that together. We'll have uh, all of our fine eating that we normally have. So I hope that you can come and be a part uh, of that. And then two Sundays from today, at both the 9 o'clock and the 11 o'clock service, David Stahl will be with us. We haven't seen or heard from David in, in, in a while. It's been several, actually it's been three or four years since he's been here. But he's excited to be here. He's going to be singing and performing during both of those services. And uh, you'll never meet anybody quite like David Stahl, okay? Uh, but he does love the Lord. And uh, he's got a, a beautiful voice and loves what he's doing. So hope that you can be here and invite friends to be a part of that. Many of you all will remember the voice of praise. Just absolutely one of my favorite groups. I just love them. But David had called me, and, and we looked at a couple of dates, and they will be here on Sunday night, November the 10th. And well, that's several weeks away, but I want you to be able to put that on your calendar and, and plan to be here. It'll be a very special time for us. Our great Wednesday activities will be uh, uh, our regular activities. You see the WMU collecting items for the diaper bag. If you have any questions about that, you'll see some things printed in the bulletin, but you can talk to any of the WM ladies about that. This is Operation Christmas Child. We'll be getting our shoe boxes ready. There's plenty of material out front and in the back that will uh, help explain exactly what items can be put in the shoe boxes and what items cannot be. So if uh, you have any questions, I'm going to ask that you speak to Donna. Donna is the one that um, knows all the nooks and crannies of that and has been working with that. And Donna, we thank you for that. Also, in the way of prayer concerns, Lisa Beverly was able to be with us this morning during the 9 o'clock service. I think most of you know that Lisa has been diagnosed with an aortic aneurysm. It is a size 6 but the doctor chooses not to do anything up right now. Don't know what they can do. But Lisa and Jerry and that family certainly needs our prayers. I attempted to call Kenneth Chandler yesterday. Since I've been out of town, I've not heard anything. I checked on before I left uh, out of town, but I'm assuming that everything seems to be uh, going well with Kenneth right now. Danny, do you have an update on that? Thursday? Okay. And then Sue Gaines was here this morning, but Sue has hurt her back. And uh, not really sure what the ideology of that is, but uh, we're just hoping and trusting that she's able to be more mobile than she was this morning. And then I want to ask you to remember uh, the Lisa Quillen family. This is Sarah Mann's aunt's son he lived uh, in Roanoke Virginia not even 30 years old but uh, he he passed away yesterday rather suddenly appears to be uh, uh, some kind of, of an overdose and I'm only saying that because that family needs our prayers at least behind a 7 year old boy so this will be uh, in Roanoke Virginia Remember Dixie Tripp, who lives in Michigan? That would be a grandmother, sir, baptized her here 
one Easter Sunday about two or three years ago, and that would be a grandmother to Josh. So let's, uh, let's remember uh, that family. I think that takes care of everything in the way of announcements right now. Our offertory hymn this morning is hymn number 425, He Keeps Me Singing. Um, let's stand. We're going to do all, we'll end up eventually doing all five verses. We'll have our fellowship time on the second verse. I haven't talked to Milkweed about this yet, but I think probably the first of November we should probably suspend the fellowship time, you know, the handshaking and all that, until maybe spring. But, that, you know, that's typically what we do anyway, so. Let's uh, let's stand as we sing uh, hymn number four twenty five. It's so good to see all the smiles and the laughter, the handshakes and the hugs. Let's never take the blessings of fellowship for granted. I'm going to ask a, a good friend of mine, a family that I've just come to know and love and appreciate in a special way. Kim Crupper, if you don't mind, would you please lead us in our offertory blessing? Amen. Mm -hmm. 
all stand for our doxology, please. We hit sing hymn number 334, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. All three verses. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, Lord of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending. If you all look in your uh, bulletin, if you have one, right under the announcements big headline, it says, Happy Birthday, Daniel. Did y'all see that? How old are you, Daniel? 33 years old. That's how, ain't, that's, that's how old Jesus was, right? When he, when he ascended into heaven. So. Exactly, right. You know what we're going to do right now? We're going to sing Happy Birthday to Daniel. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Daniel, happy birthday to you. Do you know like when I sing at the milkweed at the end it says, and you look like one too? <laughs> I realized that I failed to mention a very important prayer request, and that is Delbert Keith. Delbert and Carolyn are not with us today. He did have his surgery while I was gone and out of the country. And that they were able to put a drain tube in. But because of that, he's not able to be with us today. They feel real good about getting all of the uh, lymph nodes out that were cancerous. But this is still a very difficult situation. It, uh, it merits our prayers. And I pray that we'll continue to uh, pray for him. When they first diagnosed this, when he had the first surgery, they said that this could be a possibility because this is a very aggressive kind of cancer. So far, it hasn't gotten him down, hasn't slowed him down. He's 86 years old, and he keeps on plugging away. And I'm praying God continues to use him and bless him. Children, come on down. you all doing today? Doing good? Let me ask you a question. You don't have any idea what this is? You think it's a Bible, huh? Or a book. It could be one. It could be both. In this situation, 
It's a Bible. I mean, a, a dictionary. Okay. All right. It's a dictionary. Man, this is an old, old dictionary. I remember when I was. It says here, Milkweed, P.O. Box 248, Belmont College, Nashville, Tennessee. But I've had it longer than that. I think I bought it at the dollar store in Springfield, Tennessee when I needed a dictionary. And that was probably in the sixth or eighth grade. I'm not much older than Daniel, okay? But it has been a few years ago, okay? Now, I was looking at a word, looking up a word this morning when I was just going over some stuff in my office. And I couldn't get the internet up. So I thought, well, I gotta resort to my dictionary. The word wasn't in there. Went for another word, and it wasn't in there. Well, you know, since I was in the sixth, seventh, or eighth grade, there's been a lot of new words that have been created. There's a lot of words in the dictionary in our vocabulary now that hadn't even been thought of then. But then I turned to another book, which is the Bible. Now, there's no changes in here. You know, the, the word that was true then when God revealed it to man, is the same word that we have today. Oh, we like to change the things. We like to add to it and take it away from it. But God tells us not to do that. Hebrews, the 13th chapter, I believe it's verse 8, that says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And see, it's okay to take this and add, take away, delete words, it's okay to do that. But it's not okay to do that with God's word. So I want to encourage you. Oh, well, there's some things in there. My goodness, I'd like to change a few of those. I don't want to do that. No, let me take that out. But God knows what's best for me. God knows what's best for you. And I want to encourage you to always stay in God's word. And you'll be blessed. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, our God. We thank you for our beautiful boys and girls. Such a beautiful smile on their face, so much excitement. Being in church, being with people, being a part of life. And I pray, Lord, your blessings upon them in every way. I pray, Lord, that they will know your word. And not just know it, but hide it in their hearts. And to live it out every day of their lives. And the older they get, May they be drawn to a closer, more in-depth relationship with you and who you really are and who you want to be and what you want to be in their lives. In the beautiful name of a loving Savior, Jesus Christ, we ask these things. Amen. Catches today.
for being here today and helping us iron out some tweaks in our uh, sound system. And then I want to ask you to remember uh, Dr. Johnson and Bob Cole and Sarah Hollis uh, and all the other team members that are on their way back now from uh, Brazil. They should be now, right now, at the Lexington Airport if all is going well and on schedule and on the last leg of their trip and be home here shortly. I think it's safe to say that I never recall, I never remember a time anywhere in my ministry that I've worked up a sermon in the airport. Friday night in Rio de Janeiro, fighting through 14 million people on the interstate. And I think everybody in Brazil, and there's 14 million, were all on the interstate. It's Friday night. I was late getting to the airport, but I still started working on a different... I had material with me to prepare my sermon for today. But that's not the direction I went in. That's not the direction I felt led in. And while I really didn't feel good about this message at the 9 o'clock service, I prayed over and I really feel like that there's people that need to hear this. See, I don't know where all of you are in your pilgrimage, your relationship with God. Some people I think I know. Some people I may know. But others, I'm not sure where you are in your relationship with God. That's one of the greatest things I've talked about this week asking those people where they were in their relationship with God. There's a lot of broken people in this world. You may be here today and find yourself broken. I worked with a lot of people this past week. I see people every day, wherever I am, that's broken. What do we do? Where do we go from that broken point? What's the next step? How do we help others? that find themselves in that broken part. I'll begin by telling a story that I came across here a few weeks ago of a lady who was talking about the time when she was in the fourth or fifth grade. She was at her home, was in the kitchen, and she was using a knife to cut something. But no one had ever taught her how to use that knife. In the process of using it, the knife slipped. It cut her finger. Now, it wasn't anything real bad, but it was right on the knuckle. And because that cut was on the knuckle, it wasn't going to heal if she was continuously moving it. So the father came up with a brilliant idea. He took a popsicle stick, broke it in two, and used it as a splint on that finger. Wrapped it up put some tape on it, and in just a few minutes, the process of healing was taking place. But with it being agitated and aggravated on that knuckle, it wasn't going to create healing until it got to that point where it could be still and healing could happen. Wouldn't it be nice wouldn't it be nice if all the cuts and bruises that we have in life could be healed like that? But all of us have been around long enough and have lived long enough to know that's not always the case. In fact, many times that's far from the case. I look back at things and I say, wow, we've been sick. Maybe we've been injured. And we hope and we pray for healing in that situation. We look at our lives. We look at circumstances and situations around us. And we pray for that transformation, the change that needs to take place in our lives, in our circumstances, in our situations. There's many people that I know walk up and down the halls of hospital rooms, rehab centers, nursing homes, even visiting in homes. And there's people that long to have their health restored. What about relationships? 
certainly not going to ask for a show of hands, but how many here know of relationships that need healing? Healing in the family. Maybe at work. Maybe even in churches. There's that, that restoration that needs to take place, that transformation, a change in our condition. Well, today we're looking at a story from 2 Kings, the fifth chapter. We find here the story of Naaman. Who was Naaman? Not a man or a woman. You know? It was a man. He was a commander. He was an army commander. And we see where the first part of, of this chapter starts off talking about him being a man of valor. A lot like Gideon. He was a godly man. But Nathan, I'm going to ask that we pick up on the latter part of that. that and, and we'll read that uh, right now. Second Kings, the fifth chapter. I think this is somewhere around verse 8 or 9. And Elijah, that prophet, sent a messenger to him, meaning Naaman, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan, that's the Jordan River, seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be healed. But Naaman was angry. He went away saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out, meaning Elijah, that surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord. And he would wave his hand over the places on his body and cure the leprosy. You see right here, when we see where Naaman is upset, he's angry with God, we're told, because he wanted that fanfare. He wanted the, the, the whole pizzazz. He wanted the prophet Elijah to come and do this ceremony. That's not the way it happened. But Naaman, not all are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all of the waters and the rivers in, in Israel. Could I not wash in them and be just as clean? So Naaman went away mad. He walked away in a rage. But his servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? The prophet has told you what to do. He's a man of God. Do it. Has he actually said to you, wash and be clean. So he went down, reluctantly, but he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And what happened? His flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. May God add his blessings to the reading, the proclamation, the understanding of his holy and blessed word. See, we see Naaman that was healed of leprosy. But he was only healed after he finally, he finally followed the instructions of the prophet Elijah. And he went to do what? He went to bathe seven times, dipped himself seven times in the Jordan River. Now, I find it interesting and amazing that Naaman was initially reluctant to do what the man of God had told him to do. See, I think he was really looking at something to, to put the spotlight on him. Now, I, I want the big fanfare here, okay? If you're going to heal me, I, I want you to do it in a great and spectacular way. But he didn't do it quite like Naaman wanted it done. And he walked away angry. The servant had already told him what was required. But finally he did. He did agree. And what happened? When Naaman was obedient, he was cleansed. Now, most of us don't know a lot about leprosy. There might be some people that I want to stay away from, but it's not because they have leprosy. I don't know of anybody that has leprosy. But you need to know before we go any further in this story that if you were a leper, you were considered the most unclean of the unclean. You, were, you had cooties. 
to the 100th degree. And it was bad. You could catch it. It was contagious. And you had to be quarantined. You couldn't even get out in public. So you need to know this as we're thinking about what's, what's going on uh, right here. But he was cleansed. He was cleansed of his leprosy. And it says that his skin was completely restored to what it was before. You dig into that chapter a little bit further, and you see that he had the skin, by the time it was all over, he had the skin of a young man after he bathed in the Jordan River. Now, Nahum got exactly what he wanted. He got exactly what he asked for. He got that healing. He was healed of leprosy. It didn't happen quite the way he wanted it to happen. But nonetheless, what he asked for, what he sought for, what he prayed for, he got. I'm also reminded of Luke. In his gospel, in the 11th chapter, we find another story of miraculous healing. Now, wasn't this a miracle in, in 2 Kings? That was a miracle. He was miraculously cleansed. We see here in Luke's gospel where ten lepers asked Jesus to have mercy on me, Lord. And he did. And he told those ten lepers, go and show yourself to the priest. They did as the master had instructed. God granted them their wish. See, in these two situations, and we can look at others in God's word, but it looks like there was that, that situation that was presented, and all of a sudden, poof, it's gone. Now, folks, I'll be honest with you. I look at my life. You look at your life. Wouldn't we just love to have the magical touch of God Almighty? Whatever's going on that's wrong in our lives, health-wise, relationship-wise, whatever, and just have God to say, poof, it's God. Wouldn't that be nice? But I don't think we'd all long for that. For Nahum, Naaman, his leprosy was gone. Just as he had prayed and wished for, he was no longer afflicted. But I got to admit, that's a neat story. I like it. It's amazing. I really think I wrote in my notes, neat. It's a neat story. But it could also be a confusing story. When I interact and deal with people in life, I realize those small cuts, those small bruises that come into our lives, yeah, they can be easily healed. But what about the big ones, the major ones? where we have those major experiences of pain and suffering. And we just wish that God could do in our lives and in those situations what we see right here. Poof, it's all gone. Wouldn't that, be, wouldn't that be amazing? But the reality of it is, most of what we have to deal with in life, those situations, those circumstances, will not disappear in an instant. Even when, when we are healed, there's still the scars. There's still the after effects. There's still the memories of what remains. For most of us, healing doesn't look like the stories that we talked about here from 2 Kings or the 11th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. But what about when healing doesn't take place? I'm knocking on the door of a lot of people's hearts right now because all of us have certain things that we really wish could change in our lives. People, relationships, circumstances. We pray, we pray, we pray. We don't always get the answer. We don't always get the answer we're looking for. We fervently pray for, for healing. We fervently pray for circumstances to be changed. As we fervently pray, sometimes we see the changes taking place. Other times, we don't. See, these are the moments in our own humanness 
that we begin to question God and maybe even yelled at him. I don't know that I could ever remember a time when I really yelled at God, but maybe I did. Certainly questioned him on many situations. God, why do you give us these stories here in your word that's so powerful and so meaning and you miraculously change the situation? Well, then in our day and time, you don't pray for me. You, you don't heal my brother. You don't heal my sister. You don't heal my mother. You don't heal those broken relationships. Why is it that you worked in such a magnificent and powerful way then? And we don't see that now. Well, I think the answer for me would be when we find ourselves railing out to God and we feel like that life is just completely unfair. Sometimes it is. Well, I can say it's okay to be angry with God. It's okay to be angry with God. Now, hear the rest of the story. But at least for this point, let me say, it's okay. You're in good company if you find yourself yelling at God. I think of the psalmist. And you read his writings, and you get right into the depths of his heart, his thinking. And he, he's angry with God. And you don't have to second guess that anger. You see where it really is. What about Moses? Moses got angry with God, didn't he? Particularly there in the 40 years of those stubborn Israelites. What about the Israelites? Didn't they get angry with God? 40 years stuck out there in the desert. God did not even take any care of us. They were angry with God. I think about C.S. Lewis. Most of you should know that name. I've made reference to him quite a bit over the years. C.S. Lewis was an individual that was setting out to disprove God, the reality of God. But in the process of doing so, he was so convicted um, that not only did he believe in God, he came to know Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior as one of the greatest authors, one of the greatest thinkers of the 20th century. But he got angry with God, too. And he really got angry with God when his wife died. So being angry with God is something not foreign to us. People we see, circumstances in our own lives may bring about those same questions. So I think it's okay. And I sort of say that with a little bit of reservation because I want you to hear me out. I think it's okay to question God. I think it's part of human nature for us to be angry at God, particularly when circumstances are just not good. But what is not okay is when we stay angry with God. That's the problem. See, most people don't just get angry with God. They stay there, and they get stuck in a rut, and they never have that relationship. They never have that healing that comes from God. And that's what's so important. And see, when we find ourselves in that situation, the, the, we lose focus. We lose our focus. It becomes so narrow in who God is, what he's trying to teach us. Now, these stories of miraculous healing in God's Word, there's many of them. And, and I'm grateful for them. And sometimes God has done some miraculous things in my life. I'd be willing to bet if you look long enough and close enough, you could see where God has really done some amazing things in your life that would be deemed as miraculous, but you didn't see them that way because we weren't looking. We weren't focused in to see exactly what, what God is doing. Sometimes what we need to do is to pay close attention to what God is doing, what God is saying. How he's speaking, what he's showing us in our everyday walk. Now, we also need to take note that, that not all the stories of healing, not all the stories of transformation that's recorded in, in, in God's Word happened exactly like they did in Naaman's situation or the ten lepers there in the 11th chapter of Luke. See, I think of Jacob. 
I preached a series of sermons on Jacob several years ago. Here was a man who was injured because he wrestled with an angel. And he walked away with a limp for the rest of his life. I think about the resurrected Savior. Even though he was resurrected, he still had those wounds. He still had the scars there. You see, transformation, the transformation that we long for, the healing that we long for, can happen. It may not always be the perfect way that we want it to be. Even when things don't come down the pike the way we hope and pray. See, I've, I've learned this in life. God is still in control. See, the very fact, the, the, the central tenet, the principle, the doctrine of our Christian faith is that God brings new life out of brokenness. But only when we trust in him and put our trust there. I've been broken. You've been broken. Maybe it's something in the past. Maybe it's something that you're going to go through. Maybe where you are right now. I had an opportunity this past week. I probably, I'm guessing, I spoke about 20 times every day to small groups of adults. I was in adult evangelism. There were children evangelism, but you know, I, I remember talking about the resurrection story in many of those settings. And, and, and I talked about that Good Friday. Now, the harsh reality of Good Friday is all about brokenness, all about pain, all about suffering. But it didn't stop there. There was Sunday coming. Easter Sunday, the Resurrection Sunday. God's affirmation that death and pain and suffering does not have the last word. Sometimes we need to just step back and look at life and remind ourselves God's word tells us pain, suffering, death does not have the last word. God has the last word. And God is love. Love has the final word. New life. New life can come out of our brokenness. New life can come out of our pain. New life can come out of those moments in life when we think it's all over and done. In closing, if you're here, whether it's here physically in this sanctuary, or other places in the church where this may be voiced upstairs or in the back or out there in the video world. If you're struggling or if you have struggled with challenges in your life, if there's that brokenness, if there's that, that pain and that disconnection, the need for transformation in your life, I want to encourage you and I encourage myself. Remember what I tell you. I never preached a sermon to you that hadn't already preached to myself. I, I, I encourage you to take on the commitment to engage the reality of a living God in your life. Let him take that brokenness and use it to make you a better person, a stronger person, and more effective for the kingdom. Share God's healing. It's like Naaman. If you read the rest of that story, long beyond the fifth chapter, you see, but God used him in a marvelous way. And he told others what God had done. The same God that was at work in his life is the same God that wants to work in yours. If you haven't already let him, let's pray. Oh, Lord, our God, wow, we look at your word, 
we see how your word just speaks to us. We've read this passage somewhere in the past before. We've read the Bible. We've come across this story. But sometimes because of where we are in life, it speaks differently to us. I pray, Lord, that you would minister to us and through us in the midst of our brokenness, in the midst of that need for transformation, and allow you to do in us what you long to do and to bring new life out of brokenness and transformation. Lord, bless this time of invitation. All I'm simply asking for, nothing more, nothing less, than your will to be done in each of our lives. In the powerful name of a transforming Savior, we ask these things. Amen. Our hymn of invitation is it's hymn number 559. Let's stand as we sing. Get to carry on when the third one pops up. Has God spoken to your heart today? Has He said something to you, encouraged you through His Spirit to give new meaning and purpose to your life? If He has, I think it was worth your time to be here. You gave 60 minutes of your time to be here today. A lot more when you talk about travel time. But if it was worth your time and God was able to speak to you, then I think that's time well spent. And I thank God for you. All right. Hmm. Well, let's see here. <laughs> Brother Milkweed will tear number 624 through 26. You'll hear that again today, too. A pastor devoted to giving so much. God only knows the souls that you've touched. Committed to serve when you answered God's call. You prove it by being a servant to all. Thank you, the Children's Church Kids 2019. Pleasant Ridge Baptist Church. Thank you. Oh, and I get a kiss. They're chocolate kisses. Thank you. Love you all. Appreciate you. The paint might still be wet. Oh, the paint might still be wet. Okay, well, I will. Thank you. Appreciate that. You know, I've said this. I told, I was on an airplane yesterday. I, I, this is, I could go a long story here. I had people that wouldn't even talk to me on the plane. Some of them that could talk and couldn't understand what they were saying. But then I matched up with a guy yesterday, just a beautiful man. Young man, got a family, loves the Lord, involved in his church. And we hit it off real good. I, I created a new friendship. We created a new friendship yesterday. Where was I going with that story? <laughs> uh, oh, I was telling him, I was telling him about Pleasant Ridge. And just a beautiful bunch of people. Thank you for loving. You have been a, a 
a wonderful bunch of people, and, and we love you. I thank God for you. My prayer for you is this. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.